We are having the Lord's Supper today, and uh, we're going to be speaking about that today. The Lord's Supper, it's a precious, precious ordinance of the church. But if you have a Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 26. We'll be looking at a lot of scriptures today and uh, seeing what God has to say to us. Matthew chapter 26, and we'll begin reading in verse 20. I'll wait just a minute till you get there. Like the old preacher said, when I hear that the leaves stop rustling, it's time to start. So, Matthew 26, verse 20. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. This is after uh, Judas is betraying him, and uh, of course he knows all about this. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? Isn't that something? Nobody knew who it was, and they, they even thought about the possibility of it being them. Um, a lot of truth there. And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto the, that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? And he said unto him, Thou hast said. Now, he's already done it. So he's already betrayed him. And uh, so it's, it's really a form. Uh, some, some people call it religious fraud. But uh, he had a form of godliness. But obviously he denied the power thereof. It says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Now, the Lord knew why he came to this earth. He came to die for the sins of men. Uh, the Son of Man is given for that. So he knew from the beginning that he would go to the cross. So all of this is transpiring, and it is the will of God for him to die for the sins of the world. If you have your Bibles, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we read this, most of it, um, every time we have the Lord's Supper. But this is Paul giving instruction about Matthew chapter 26. And let's begin reading here in verse 23. The Bible says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. And so we have those scriptures, and they're very familiar scriptures to us. We could probably quote them by heart. But there's such a deep meaning in that. And it's something that the Lord wants us to remember and to celebrate with him. So we will do that today. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, thank you for the gift of your son. Thank you for the gift of eternal life through our faith in Jesus Christ. And one day we will be with you forever. We look forward to that. I pray, Lord, until that day comes that we would be faithful, that we would worship you and praise you for all that you've done for us. May you bless the word today for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. It's, it's great scripture. It's great truths that we talk about. The background of the text in Matthew, it's the Last Supper. Uh, Jesus is going to the cross. He is going to be betrayed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is giving instruction, and it says, this do in remembrance of me. God is saying that. Until I come, I want you to celebrate that. And it is a picture of his death. The cup is the poured out blood, 
and the broken bread is the broken body. And so that's a picture that the Lord is giving us. And that elicits some emotion in us. Amen? Uh, we can turn it off. We can just kind of be bored with it or ignore it. But when we really think about what actually took place on that cross, the Son of God, God in the flesh, dying for our sins, dying in our place, taking our sin upon him, it ought to bring some emotion. Amen? Maybe, and, and it doesn't have to be an excited thing. Uh, some people are very emotional, and you could never tell. But uh, love, or joy, or peace, or gratefulness, or praise, all of those different emotions because of all that God has done for us. In Numbers chapter 21, uh, the children of Israel were murmuring against Moses, and God sent fiery serpents into the camp. You probably remember this story. And whoever was bitten by the fiery serpent these poisonous serpents, they died. And so Moses prayed, and God told Moses, well, I want you to take some brass, make a serpent of brass, put it up on a pole, and lift it up, and tell the people to look and live. And whoever looked at that brazen serpent lifted up on a pole did not die because being bitten by the fiery serpent that had no power over them. And... Um, we find in the Bible that the serpent is a picture of the devil. Brass is a picture of judgment. And it was lifted up. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. We come to the book of John, John chapter 3. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then, it's John 3, 16, the most recognized, memorized, used verse in the entire Bible is preceded by this little story here, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, and then it compares that to the Lord Jesus Christ. He became sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He became sin for us. He became that sin, that serpent being judged on the cross. And so that you see that comparison there. That, that is wonderful, amen, that our sins are paid for. And that, that that sting of death and that serpent's poison has no effect on us because we're children of God because of the payment of Jesus Christ. In 2 Kings chapter 18, this is 900 years after Numbers 21. 900 years later, I want you to kind of get a, get a handle on that. 900 years later, Hezekiah becomes king. And in chapter 18 and verse 4, the Bible says Hezekiah, he removed the high places, break the images, and cut down the groves. That's where idolatry took place, idol worship. And so Hezekiah is destroying all that. He's getting rid of all that. Same verse, same verse. And he break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. Wow, now think about that. 900 years later, here's the brazen serpent. And it goes on and says, For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it. They took that symbol where God said, Look and live, and they made an idol out of the symbol, a form. And they worshipped it just like their other idols. And it says that Hezekiah called it Nehushtan. That means piece of brass. That's all it was. And he got rid of it. Amen. The Bible says, making the word of God of non-effect through your tradition. That's Mark 7, 13. And we find that Jesus had more trouble with the Pharisees than he ever did the publicans because they made the word of God of none effect by their traditions. Well, you can't do this unless you wash your hands. There were so many, listen, all our children would be dead if you had to wash your hands before you ate. Amen? I mean, they would, that sin would never go away. That was a little joke. A couple of you got it. Thanks for laughing. But uh, Jesus had more trouble with that tradition because the sinner, the sinner would recognize he's a sinner. But the Pharisees, well, I thank God I'm not like them. I do this, this, and this. You know, we know all those stories from the Bible. Uh, I think it's vital. Uh, probably that's just not the right word to use. It should be a much more important word than that. But 
it's vital that we have a heart religion. Because anything we do for the Lord to honor and glorify Him is from the inward man. Amen? We can do all kinds of things out here, but our heart needs to be in what we do, what we worship. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Uh, we serve the Lord. We sing. We sing in the spirit, the Bible says. We give our offerings. We pray, partaking of the Lord's Supper. Amen? This is, this is such an important thing. Next week, we're going to be baptizing. That is such an important thing. And we'll teach on that. And I mean, it's, it's powerful because it's something that pleases God. Amen? Amen. I think what, if you can come and honor that assembly that we're going to have, and those two dear folks who just recently were saved, they're going to be baptized. They're excited about it. Amen? Amen. Uh, but it's just such an important thing. Uh, it has an inward meaning to us. This has an inward meaning to us. And we will do it, and we will... The verses, I, I know, they're repetitive, but line upon line, precept upon precept, while I was musing, the fire burned, and so thy word have I hid in my heart, and here it is again, and seeing, and reading, and hearing, and it all goes together, and it's something, it's a worship time, it's a love, it, they call it a love feast. That's what the Lord's Supper is. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Love the Lord with all your heart. But the problem is the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, God does. And so he says, my son, give me your heart. So we give our heart to him. We, we do have deceitful hearts. Amen? We do have, like the Old Testament prophet said, the plague of the heart. But God wants to give us a new heart. And so we give him our heart. John chapter 15 and verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. That's what Jesus did for us. Greater love. And it wasn't only his friends. He did it for his enemies. Amen? Um, we have the scripture, but God commended his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Ephesians 5.25, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And then John 3.16. I don't know if anybody knows that verse. We all know it. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. What a blessing that is. There is no question today that God loves you. I mean, you, could, you can go through the scripture. You'll see his mercy. You'll see his grace. You'll see his sacrifice. You'll see his love, amen, for you. But the question is, 1 John 4.19, we love him. Do we love him? Remember last week, John chapter 21. Peter, do you love me? Yea, Lord. Well, do this. Do you love me? And we, we go through that. And so, do we love the Lord? That's where everything in the Christian life focuses on. Our love for him. We love him. And then there's a word, because. If we only had this verse to preach on, this is so powerful. We love him because what? He first loved us. His sacrifice gives birth to our sacrifice. His mercy gives birth to our mercy. His love to our love. Amen? And we have nothing unless we have him. The, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So he is precious. Amen? His word is precious. That's emotion. That's emotion. You say, well, sometimes I'm not emotional. We will get to that. But we love him because he first loved us. I think that's so powerful. Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. What well, hasn't he been merciful to you? That ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. It is your reasonable service. It's very reasonable that I love him because he first loved me. Now, we could look in the world, we could say, well, you did me a favor, you brought me a meal, I'll bring you a meal. That, that might not have any emotion in it. Amen? Well, you know, you picked me up in the rain, and my car had a flat tire, you took me here. I owe you one, right? I owe you one. That can be done without any emotion. This cannot be done without any emotion. We love him because he first loved us. And it's our reasonable service. 
Amen? It's just, it just makes sense when it's there. It's such a blessing. Um, in Revelation chapter 2, uh, John is writing about the church at Ephesus. And man, they were a good church. They knew who was lying about doctrinal things that said they were apostles and found them to be liars. They did this right. They did that right. You can see all the commendation there. But there's a condemnation there too. And Jesus said this, or the Bible says this, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. You've left your first love. Look at, but look how busy I am. Look at all the stuff I do. And he says, yeah, but you've left your first love. There's a story in the Old Testament. I think it was with Elijah or Elisha, one of the two. But there, were, there was a, a man, and he's cutting down a tree. And the axe head falls off. You remember the story and falls in the water. And this guy was smart enough to stop chopping. And it doesn't have, well, no axe head, you're not going to get anywhere. Well, no, I'm just going to keep hitting that tree with this, this axe handle and see what happens. No, he lost the axe head. And so he comes back to the Lord and he says, I've lost the axe head. Alas, master, it was borrowed. Profound responsibility, or for the prophet, he went to the prophet. And the prophet said, where did you lose it? Isn't that deep? Man, I, I lost the axe head. Where'd you lose it? That, that is powerful. Amen? Well, any new convert, when you got saved, man. And again, you don't have to, you know, run and scream and jump, but there's some emotion. There's some connection. There's some love to Almighty God. Well, I, I don't have that like I used to. Where did you lose it? That's all you have to do. Well, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not faithful. I, I really don't read my Bible. I, my prayer closet, you know, I just don't. I just, my mind is filled with other things. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. Where did you lose it? God doesn't want you to lose that. He wants you to find it again. So in Revelation chapter 2, it's you've left your first love. Remember and repent. That's the instruction. Remember, where did you lose it? Where did you leave your first love? And then repent, which is, I'm going this direction. Repentance is turning around and going this direction. So I, I know I had it one time, this, this love, this desire, this, this peace. But it seems like I've lost it. All you have to do is, where did I lose it? And the Lord is right there waiting. Amen? He gives instruction for all of that. Do you, okay, uh, you don't have to answer this, and let's not see any elbows, okay? No elbows. Do you love your wife? Do you love your husband? Do you love your children? Do you love your parents? Okay? And we would, we would probably answer in the affirmative to all of those. Um, have you ever had an argument? Okay. Husband's wife never had an argument. Okay, that's good. The Bible says, thou shalt not lie. It's a terrible sin. Amen? Okay, do you ever get mad at each other? Okay, let's tone it down. Okay, we don't argue and we don't get mad at each other. <laughs> uh, have you ever been irritated with each other? Anybody want to give us an example? No, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. That'd be a bad service. Amen? You ever irritated do you ever take each other for granted? Remember when, man, I mean those early days, you know? Oh, oh, I, I just can't even explain it, right? To, what are you doing now? You know? What's wrong with you? Okay, okay. Uh, do you, irritated, take for granted, okay. How come? How come I cook these meals all the time and you never say thank you? You used to open the car door. You used to let me go first. You used to this, that, the other thing. Okay, this isn't a, a wedding thing or a marriage thing, but it, it's a relationship. But you still love your wife and you still love your husband, even though you take that for granted sometimes, even though sometimes you get irritated 
with how the Lord is working in our life, but we still love him. Amen? Sometimes the love just grows cold. You ever apologize? You ever wrong about anything? Well, no, I'm never wrong. She's always wrong. Well, I'm never wrong. He's always wrong. Okay, that's a wonderful relationship. You know, that's an irresistible force and an unmovable object. And that is not going to be the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Somebody said, well, you can have unity without harmony. And he illustrated it by you tie two cats, their tails together, and throw them over a clothesline. You have unity, but you don't have harmony, okay? So, so what, what happens when we say, it's me, sweetheart. It's me, honey. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, and I ought, to, I ought to be like I used to be or be different, or I apologize. Hey, that's good, amen? That, well, I'm not apologizing until they apologize. You might wait a long time, you know? But I think it's important. I think it's important to do that. Remember and repent. Matthew 24, verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Uh, wax, it's, a, it's a, an old word. It means to pass from one state to another. So I was warm. I was on fire. But my love is waxing Cold. You have 2 Timothy 3.13. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse from one state to another, deceiving and being deceived. Um, we're supposed to be growing in grace. Amen? Grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And not just in the area of service. This is in the area of our hearts, our emotions. In uh, Luke chapter 10, there's a story about Mary and Martha. And you don't have to turn there, but I just want to read a few verses here. In Luke chapter 10, it says, in verse 38, Now it came to pass as they went, he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Man, Jesus is here. Jesus is here. Man, I'm going to sit at his feet and hear what he has to say. Think how important that is. Think how wonderful that is. And it says, but Martha was cumbered about. Cumbered. Uh, I had, that means uh, troubled or critical. Cumbered. It says, but Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. This led to, how come they're not doing what I'm doing? How come they're not helping me? And it became criticism. <clears throat> and it ruined Martha's spirit. Here's what the Lord says about it. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Mary hath chosen that good part. That's sitting at the feet of Jesus, amen? That's where a lot of people lose their ax head. It's important. Um, the good part is a choice. Psalm 18, I will love thee. I will call upon thee. Genesis chapter 29, remember the story of Jacob and, and he gets to Uncle Laban's house and uh, Laban had deceived his way, deceived his, 10 times, changes wages 10 times. But here, Jacob loves Rachel. Man, he loves Rachel. Rachel gave him the hairy eyeball, you know, and it just, it, it took his heart. And so, you never heard that, Gino? Oh, man. Oh, man. You never gave him the hairy eyeball? No. Okay, guys. Yeah. Yeah, there's trouble here. But anyway, uh, so, so he says, I'll work seven years for you, for Rachel. Seven years. And at the end of the seven years, remember, uh, God, or, uh, Laban gave him Ra uh, Leah, Leah, and so he had to work longer. But this is what it says in verse 20. 
Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. Wow. For the love he, this is nothing. Seven years, hard labor, doesn't matter. Man, look at the prize. Amen? Look at the prize. And here we are with the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, God in the flesh. God coming, preparing a place for us. He's coming again to receive us. And it's no sorrow, no sickness, no pain, nothing like that. And we're going to be with him forever. Is there not a love for that? And what's seven years? What's 70 years to know that one day we'll be with him? Amen? And there will be a wedding for sure. That's a blessing. Second Corinthians chapter 8, the Macedonian believers, they first gave them their own selves to the Lord out of deep poverty. They, they loved God, what God had done for them. And in ver chapter 8, verse 28, Paul says, Wherefore, show ye to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. The proof of your love. They certainly had that. Uh, I'm going to turn back to Luke chapter 7. If you want to turn there with me, we'll read quite a few verses here. This is about the Lord going into the Pharisee's house. And uh, it's quite a story. I don't want to miss any of it. I, I could tell you the story, but I don't want to miss one word of this story. And this is Luke chapter 7, and we'll begin reading in verse 36. Luke chapter 7 and verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman that is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus knew that. And Jesus knew what this man was thinking. He said it in, it was his thought. And he knew exactly what he was thinking. He knows our thoughts, amen? And the Bible says, And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. God's words to us, are just laser focused amen you read the bible in the morning and it's laser focused to your need uh, you come to church i don't know how god does it but some of it is laser focused just just to what you're going through Be anytime you read it anytime you quote it you could read the same story 20 times and get something fresh every time because the book's alive and it says there was a certain creditor which had two debtors, and one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water. For my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Let me just say, God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. It, he died for the world, amen? So he's willing to forgive all of us. And we, it's, it's a great price that nobody could pay. It has to be forgiven by God. And those that recognize that forgiveness, those that experience it, those that see how real it is to them and how beneficial and wonderful it is to them, will love much according to this story which the Lord tells. Amen? And it's just another example of that good part, that blessing. In Exodus chapter 21, there's a story 
about the bond servants and they would sell themselves uh, for six years and in the seventh year that Sabbath they would go free but they would they would sell themselves to somebody to work and that would be sort of a payment and at the end of the six years they could go out free and here's the story in Exodus chapter 21 one of the men didn't want to go out and he said I love my master I will not go out free and so they bored a hole with an awl and he, he was a marked man that he would be the servant of this master forever because he loved his master we are free we have liberty amen we have been made free from sin the Bible says that through the blood of Christ he is our master, amen? And we serve him because we love him, because of all that he has done for us. It's such a wonderful thing. Leviticus chapter 7, and this, this will kind of wind down here. There were all kinds of feasts and offerings in the Old Testament, and they were given specific instructions on specific days to sacrifice certain things. And one such feast or uh, sacrifice was Leviticus 7:12. If he offer it for a thanksgiving, then he shall offer with the sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened cakes mingled with oil, unleavened wafers anointed with oil, and cakes mingled with oil of fine flour fried. Okay, here's a, here's a thanksgiving sacrifice. Get the cakes, get the flour, let's make these, let's put the oil in, and then we're going to give these to the Lord. Um, one more portion of scripture to look at with me, Isaiah chapter 1. If you'll turn back there, I've got my Bible marked, so I'm there already. But Isaiah chapter 1, powerful, powerful scriptures. Do you know many of the sacrifices and the feasts in the Old Testament just became a dull form, ritual? The hearts of the Jews was not in it. I'm sure it was with some. But there were many that it was just something to do. It was just, you know, okay, it's a feast day. Okay, it's Christmas. Okay, it's Easter. Okay, it's the Lord's Supper. Okay, somebody's getting baptized. It just became so redundant. So here it is again. And, uh, you know, look at Isaiah chapter 1. This is God. Verse 11. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? Saith the Lord, I am full of the burnt offerings of rams, the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblation. Incense is an abomination unto me. Incense in the Old Testament. It's a type of prayer. It's a picture of prayer. Vain, repetitious prayers. Uh, the new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear your hands are full of blood. There's a verse in the Psalms that talks about the heavens becoming brass. When there's sin in our heart, our prayers, are it's just like the heavens are brass. And that's what God is talking about here. And then he says in verse, oh, it's, it's all so good. Verse 18, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Just come. Just come, learn to do well, the, pri the previous verse says, because it's always an answer. Where did I lose my axe head? Why am I just in this, this form? Why, why is the excitement gone or the, the love gone? God always wants to show us that. Psalm 107, 22. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. This isn't bringing a cake or anything like that. This is our lips. This is Psalm 116, 17. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. 
Jeremiah 33, 11, the voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the voice of them that shall say, praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endureth forever, and of them that shall bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. That's, that's the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Praise God. Amen. Praise God for all that he's done. J Jonah chapter 2 and verse 9, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. Hebrews 13, 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks. Bob Jones Sr., when gratitude dies on the altar of a man's heart, that man is well nigh hopeless. And God, to praise him, to worship him, to adore him, it's what we say, it's what we feel in our hearts. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. But sometimes it's not in your heart. It's true. Sometimes it's not in your heart. This is where the real sacrifice comes in. It's not in your heart to praise God, but it's right to praise God. Amen? It's not in your heart to pray. Have you ever? You know, I don't feel like praying today. That's why he says pray without ceasing. Yeah. And rising up a great while before day, he departed into a solitary place and there prayed. That, and our Savior did that because he loved the Father. Father loved the Son. Amen? But sometimes you don't feel like praying. That's when you need to pray. Amen? And it's a sacrifice to do that. It's a sacrifice to memorize and use his word. But sometimes it's not in your heart. Job. Boy, Job was a godly man. But he lost everything. And he said this. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That was a sacrifice to say that. Amen. Boy, God's so good to me. Look, man, I got this. I did everything. I'm all over and over and over. And it's true. He daily loads us with benefits, but they're not all material benefits. Amen? The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Paul, three times. Paul, look what he did for God. I mean, he did so many things for God. He suffered the loss of all things and counted them but dung. And he says, Lord, I've got a physical ailment. It's my eyes, please. This thorn in the flesh, please take it from me. You would think, man, that's going to be answered. If anybody's going to get a prayer answered, it's Paul. Three times he prayed, and God says, no, but my grace is sufficient for you. Whoa. Here's a sacrifice. Well, gladly will I rejoice in my infirmities, in my necessities, in my persecutions. Man, because when I'm weak, then I'm strong because it's the strength of the Lord. It's his grace. Amen? You have David's mighty men, 2 Samuel chapter 23. David, man, those mighty men were very, very faithful to him. He's, he's the king. They're fighting the Philistines. And uh, David makes a comment. He just makes a comment. And three of his mighty men overheard this comment. And he said, Oh, that I had just a drink of the water from the well of Bethlehem. Man, I remember how refreshing that was. The problem was the Philistines were encamped around that, and they had control of that area. And these three men went out at night, and they broke through the host of the Philistines, and they got, they got some water from the well of Bethlehem, simply because they overheard that would please our king. That would please our master. Oh, just if he had one drink from the well of Bethlehem. And they come and they bring it back to David. You know what David did? He took the water and he poured it out. He poured it out as an offering unto God. These men risked their lives. This, this water is too precious for me to drink. I'm going to let the Lord have this as a sacrifice. You ever do anything? We have a king, amen? And he's, he's much more 
important to us than David was to those men. And we hear him. We, we read. We know his mind. We know his heart. We know what he desires and loves in us. Amen? And so we gather our sacrifice and we pour it out. Maybe it's your life. Maybe it's your time. Maybe it's your substance. You pour it out before the Lord. And it seems like it's wasted. It seems like there's no profit to it at all. Listen, with God, there's no waste. Mary, when she broke the alabaster box of ointment and poured it out on the Lord, the disciples, the disciples said, why was this waste of the ointment made? And Jesus said, let her alone. She hath wrought a good work on me. Wheresoever the gospel shall be preached, this also which Mary hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. She poured it out on him. What a waste. We could have, we could have done so much with that. No, you just, you just hear his heart. You read, you, you hear his mind, his thoughts. And you say, this would please you, Lord. And nobody else might know about it. You might, whatever the sacrifice is, whatever it is, because you love him and you know what would please him. And you don't have to have the crowd saying, yay. He made himself of no reputation. And it seems the reputation can hurt rather than help sometimes. What do we do? Pour it out. Mary and Martha, uh, their brother had died. Lazarus is in the grave. Jesus knew what he would do, and he had a purpose in doing what he did, and so he didn't go right away. Lazarus was sick. Now Lazarus has died. He's in the grave, and Jesus said, okay, let's go. And he gets there, and Martha meets him. Lord, if you'd have been here, if you'd only been here earlier, you missed it. You could have saved our brother. Mary comes. She says the same thing. So it must have been talked about. Where's the Lord? Where's God when you need him? You ever say that? Yeah, how come he's letting me go through this? You know, what, what is this? How come nobody else notices? Nobody else is helping. I'm cumbered about. And so Jesus said, no, there's a reason I was late. It's so that all these people would see the glory of God. And he called Lazarus for us out of the grave. Amen? Amen. He doeth all things well. And that ought to thrill us. It just ought to thrill us. And so we celebrate the Lord's Supper today. Mm. He's so good to us. He died for us. And when we look at that cup and we think about the shed blood, it doesn't have to bring tears it can. It doesn't have to bring an outward show, but it can. But it certainly ought to do something here. And if it doesn't, when you go home today, just ask God where you lost the axe head, where you left the first love, in the prayer closet, and where, wherever it is. Because he's worthy of our love. He's worthy of our worship. And he says, remember this. Remember this till I come. That's how important it is. Let's bow our heads. Father, oh God, how grateful we are. God, how grateful we are. And we so look forward to one day all of the heartache, all of the suffering, all of the trial will be over because of your promise. And I pray as we partake of your supper now that we'll remember all that you did, that we might be provided that. You go to prepare a place for us and if you go to prepare a place for us, you will doubtless come again. That where you are, there we may be also. Bless us now. May our minds be able to think about this. 
not about the rest of the day or anything, just to think about this. In Jesus' name, amen.